You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production. Unlike with your children, you are allowed to have a favorite pet. It's totally socially acceptable to have a dog or a cat that you love more than the other pets you've owned. And so it's only natural to be devastated when that pet dies. To hope as you mourn that your next pet will be something like them. As cuddly, as loving, as full of energy or curiosity or whatever made them so special. And that hope is no longer an impossible one. I have my bear-like kitties. If I can't have the real bear, I can have bear-like kitties. That's a British Columbia woman. She cloned her beloved cat after it passed away. And now has two kittens created from his genetic material. On the surface, hey, it's a lovely little story about the power of modern science. A little below the surface, questions about how much this process costs, who it's available to, and how difficult it really is. A little deeper than that, questions of animal consent, genetic ethics, and the health risks to all the animals involved. And at the very bottom is the big one. If technology has come this far since Dolly the sheep became the first cloned animal, if it's now readily available to anyone with a dead pet and a lot of money, what comes next? Endangered animals? Extinct animals? People? I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Carrie Bowman is a bioethicist as well as an assistant professor at the University of Toronto. He's here to take us inside a world that is rapidly expanding, I guess, Carrie. It really is rapidly expanding. I mean, there's more and more uh, cloning of animals going on on several fronts. We'll start with a front that uh, I certainly didn't, and I imagine many of our listeners didn't know was happening so quickly. Just to give us a sense, uh, who is Chris Stewart? And I guess more importantly for us, uh, who are her cats? Yeah, so, you know, I of course don't know this woman personally, but I understand her story to be that she had a cat that she was profoundly attached to, and I, I think many people can relate to that. And that cat was killed, I believe, by an automobile, a vehicle. And she chose to have that cat cloned. Now, that took a while. I I believe it took a couple of years. And it was tremendously costly. Yet she feels, and I, I see this quoted, that she's profoundly grateful to have done it. And the cloning resulted in, and this is not uncommon, she ended up with two cloned cats. So those would be two cats that share the identical DNA to the cat that she lost. So, you know, with cloning, there's many, many problems and many, many risks. But but one of the many things people would need to be prepared for is when it is successful, there, there could be more than one. There could be two, three, possibly even four. Not always what most people had in mind for the dog they love, not really wanting it times three, but this is what may occur. So this is happening right now. This is technology that is uh, available, I guess, to people with the means to do it. I think, like I said, most people would be surprised to hear that. How How common or rare is this? It's becoming far more common. So, you know, the first cloning is really quite some time ago. That was Dolly the sheep, and that was in the year 1996. Dolly didn't last all that long. She 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 died, uh, you know, uh, relatively young. And that's another great concern is, is many cloned animals have congenital birth defects, essentially. By standards, they don't live a full life expectancy. Now, look, I've got to be clear, that is improving. And the more cloning that's done, uh, likely that will improve. But the cloning of pets is really something 21st century. And it's becoming increasingly common. We, you know, we just talked about this, this situation that occurred here in Canada. Barbara Streisand's been very, very open about it. One of her dogs she had cloned. I also think if I remember Barbara Streisand has, has two offspring from that clone. She finds the personalities, plural, uh, to be different, and she's still very satisfied, but from the dog that she had. So remember that, you know, a clone, it has the same genetic sequence as, as the original, 
But, you know, those genes could be expressed somewhat differently. So even the coat on a cat or a dog could come up somewhat different, not identical to, to the others, because genes are expressed differently. So how common is it? You know, we don't have exact data. It's tremendously costly. Prices are probably going to come down. But at this point, it's still in, in U.S. dollars. I understand it to be dogs are much trickier to clone for some complex um, physiological reasons. About 50000 for a dog and about 35000 for a cat. Okay. And I'm not sure how they run the meter, you know, like... I, I don't know how, what they do about all the failed attempts, and I don't know if that's contingent on the live outcome. But as you can see, there's going to be a lot of people that could never afford this, especially with celebrities doing this. It will become more and more common. But, you know, let me draw your attention to something. Most of our association with cloning is, you know, science fiction, <laughs> Netflix shows, something very, very out there. Please remember, clones occur in nature. We've all known twins, and there's a world of difference between identical and non-identical twins. Most of us over the course of our lives have known both identical and non-identical twins. But, you know, identical twins are essentially clones of each other. We tend to find the word a little creepy, a little science fiction-y, but they absolutely occur in nature. And, and you know, we've all known twins. They may be very similar in appearance. They may be somewhat similar in personality, but we would all agree they are not the same person. They don't think the same. They're not robots. We need to keep that in mind because we kind of have a misperception about clones that they're some kind of automatons and, and you know, they're sort of soulless or empty or something. And that's really not true for animals or for people. You mentioned Dolly the sheep, and maybe I think it's a good place. I mean, obviously, it's a good place for this story to start, but a good place for you to explain how important was Dolly and how did we get uh, from Dolly to where we are now? Yeah, so one of the probably one of the main reasons for cloning Dolly. Well, first of all, it's, it's scientific breakthrough. People can become very famous, et cetera, et cetera. But within the livestock industry, not talking about pets, but talking about livestock, if, in fact, you come across sheep, cattle, you know, because we commodify animals, which is another huge problem. If we come across, for example, cows that, you know, the quality of the milk and the quality of the meat, maybe both, I don't know, is extremely high. The argument would be, well, you know, rather than trying all this interbreeding and crossbreeding, why don't we just clone? So the cloning within livestock is something that will become and is increasingly becoming more and more common. We like what we see, so therefore, let's just keep cloning it. So within livestock, it's being driven, and it's being driven by market forces, because in livestock, my understanding is it has not taken off in a massive way because it's not there yet, but it could in the future. And with pets, as expensive as it is, anyone could see there's a lot of money to be made because people's attachment to animals is huge, and people with the means would probably consider this. Can you walk us, and I understand, you know, you're not um, a scientist at the very center of this, but uh, in a way that, you know, people like myself can understand, walk us through the process of, you know, I have my favorite cat that died a little while ago. What do I need in order to be able to begin this process? And what does it look like? First thing you need is pots of money. Right. And uh, I don't know about you, but I don't have pots of money. And and if I did, I, I'm not sure I'd do this because I think there are other ways to spend pots of money. So essentially, what, what one would do is you would insert, I, I'm really simplifying this, but you would insert the DNA and the genetic sequence from the deceased animal into a, an egg that has, you know, been generated from a cat. That would be then become a zygote, mostly through electric currents and such. And so it would be planted in so that the, the egg itself is not from the animal that's being cloned, but the genetic content is. That would then be inserted back into a cat, which might be the cat that generated the egg that has been enucleated, meaning the genetic content had been taken out, or another one, and likely more than one, because, you know, you're raising the odds. And if things went very, very well, please remember, this is less than 5% would result in a live birth. And even after that, there'd still be a lot of loss within the early weeks and months, very high miscarriage and stillborn rates. 
and often no pregnancy at all. Why is that actually? Can you t- say a little bit more about that? Because you mentioned earlier also that these animals don't live long. So what are just in, in total all the risks involved to the animal here? Well, there's quite a lot. I mean, first of all, let's talk about cats just as an example. You know, there's some poor female cat, and obviously animals can't consent to anything. And, you know, you're doing this out of love for animals, but you have to remember some female cat is going to have aches removed from her. And that's that's quite a process, actually. And there's risks of infection with that. They can go into shock. This happens with people as well. She would then be, could be a different cat, could be the same cat, I, probably a different cat. But she would then be forced to follow a pregnancy that may not end well. There could be stillbirth. There could be miscarriage. Very high chance, by the way, of both those things. So, you know, it's not just about your pet. Other animals have to be involved in the process. So that's one of the ethical considerations. Success rates are low. Costs are high. And, you know, If we're going to now talk about the ethics of all of this, I'm not going to tell people this is unethical or ethical. I mean, people have to figure this out for themselves. But if you consider the amount of, if we're talking about pets, let's just talk about dogs and cats for a moment. In this world, the amount of stray and suffering dogs and cats on this planet is phenomenal. And it's getting better thanks to a lot of hard work of a lot of wonderful people that are out all over the world trying to help with this, but there's tremendous suffering of all animals all over the world. So one could easily argue, is this a reasonable use of large amounts of money when we have so much animal suffering in the world and we could be doing other things to prevent that animal suffering? But look, I leave those questions up up to the people involved. I see many ethical horrors in the work that I do. Uh, You know, I don't think this is the greatest ethical challenge that we've ever faced. And when I say we, you know, we're talking about this as people. We're not the ones being cloned. That's illegal, by the way, if you ask me that. So, you know, animal cloning isn't. But, you know, it's the commodification of the animal as well. So you've got the potential harm. You've got potential disability and death that comes to the clone, and you've got tremendous costs. And the argument is perhaps that money could be better spent elsewhere. But, you know, you can't really tell other people how to be spending their money. It's just not reasonable. Animals do have some kind of rights uh, in some countries. You know, there are laws against animal cruelty. We've spent years campaigning against product testing on animals. You know, how does this process compare to some of that stuff? Well, it's a beginning. You know, I wouldn't actually go as far as to call it animal rights. What I would say is animals have some protection under the law. Some people might say rights. I'm not sure we've come that far. So, you know, the argument would be, is this a form of animal abuse and a form of animal cruelty? I'm going to leave that as an open question because some people would say it is, particularly, you know, for this female cat that has to donate eggs and and go through the surgical process of that and then carry a pregnancy that may come off the rails at any point. You know, is that abuse? A lot of people listening are going to think it clearly that is, and I respect their decision on that. But that is part of it. That is definitely part of it, those types of things. But when you really begin to look at all the factors involved, the tremendous cost, the really poor success rates, the potential for negative medical outcomes for both the uh, gestational carrier, that's the female cat carrying, the cat that's having eggs retrieved, as well as the offspring itself, it really begins to pile up in a very, very negative way. Can it work? It has worked. I mean, Barbara Streisand, I I watched the interview. You know, I don't think she's a monstrous. I don't know Barbara Streisand. Who does? But, you know, I, I don't think she meant any harm by this. And she now is very happy with her dogs. But she seems a little surprised how different they are than the cloned one. So there's all of these factors to think about. We've been talking about cloning pets because, A, I was surprised at how accessible, even if it's just for rich people right now, the technology is, and it's how most people will encounter it. 
You mentioned that one of the ethical concerns is, could we be using this money for something else? So I'll put that to you in a different way. If we're going to be cloning animals, shouldn't we be cloning endangered animals, extinct animals? Uh, One of us had to say the words Jurassic Park before we ended this interview. Yes, we did. And Jurassic Park always comes up. Of course. And so you're raising a very important point. Jurassic Park, the problem with Jurassic Park is is that's from the Jurassic period, and that's, oh, I'm trying to remember, 65 million years ago, I think is the correct answer, by the way, and the DNA is just not there. Right. But we have extinct species like woolly mammoths. Now, please remember, woolly mammoths, so, you know, the big orange hairy elephant-looking guys, right? Those are not dinosaurs, by the way, and I think most people listening will know that. And, and there's different species of woolly mammoths, but they've been gone for... Some argue as, as recently as 8,000 years ago, but, but much more than that, let's say 20,000 years ago for most or, or far more, even 100,000 years ago. But what is happening is woolly mammoth carcasses and babies, now that we have this, the wonders of, of climate change and global warming, are showing up, meaning they're coming out of ice packs and things like that. Um, not so much in Canada, but certainly in the Russian Federation in Siberia. And look, the DNA is not perfect, but it's pretty good. And so what has happened, I'm using woolly mammoths as an example, is the genome of the woolly mammoth has been mapped and the techniques might be similar. So there are no woolly mammoths alive. We all know that. But the closest related species is the Asian elephant. And there's a project in process right now in which somehow, either through artificial gestation or some poor female elephant, is going to have to have an, uh, a woolly mammoth embryo inserted into her. The woolly mammoth, plural, could begin to be born, some would argue, within the next 10 years, if not sooner. So are there benefits to that? Some people would say there are, that woolly mammoths, you know, had a, had a great impact on, on northern environments. But it's an open question. And, you know, one of the things to remember in resurrecting extinct species you don't have genetic diversity. If there's one thing a clone doesn't have, it's genetic diversity, mm-hmm. you know, and multiple clones, unless you have other sources. And even if you do, you'd need a lot of other sources, doesn't. So there's a lot of examples, the Tasmanian tiger, which is a marsupial species from the, the island of Tasmania, which is one of the Australian states, may well be resurrected. And then there's endangered animals. So we look at things Gore, you know, spectacular species like gorillas and things like this. You know, why worry about them going extinct? Because we can clone them back. We're cloning them with huge risk, I would argue. We're not dealing with the heart of the problem as to why they went extinct in the first place. And we, there's no reason to believe, you know, it, it's going to help with the ecosystems, particularly if they're cloned animals with health problems and lacking genetic diversity. So would it be fair to worry then that scientists may be so preoccupied with whether or not they can, they may not stop to think if they should? Well, I think that's exactly what's going on, by the way. And I think in the woolly mammoth, that's very much the case. There's already a proposed park in the Russian Federation, a proposed park meaning where they will be put, where people can come and visit. This is before the war, so I don't know how that's going to play out. But my point here is market forces is driving this It's driving it on livestock, it's driving it on pets, companion animals, and it is driving it on extinct and endangered species. What's lost on all of this market forces is, is this a good idea and is it an ethical thing to be doing? That's pushed its way to the bottom of the list and market forces are driving all of this. It's also considered way cool. I mean, believe me, if there was a, a small herd of woolly mammoths somewhere on the planet Earth, people would be paying an awful lot of money to go on a woolly mammoth safari to see them. Maybe, say, on an island in Costa Rica. Yes, that's right. Too hot for woolly mammoths. What other species it could be, yeah. I'm joking, but only partly. But I want to end by asking you to look forward to the future because we have listed a lot of the problems that we currently have with cloning these animals. This technology is going to get better. It's not going to get worse. Will those issues with genetic diversity and defects and and the success rate improve with time to the point where this becomes more commonplace? 
Genetic diversity, no, absolutely no, because by the very nature of, of cloning, it won't, unless you've got multiple. So if we're talking endangered animals, you'd have to find multiple, multiple, multiple individuals to clone. But in terms of the congenital, the birth defects, you know, I, I can't fully say, but it seems to me, and the trend is, that it's going to continue to improve. But, you know, I don't want to sound too cynical here, but I think I'm going to. Market forces is going to drive this, whether we see ethical problems with it or not. And I think it's very important that we have this conversation. And, you know, this will be another topic for another day, but human cloning is not far behind any of this at all. It's illegal in many Western nations. That doesn't mean it's illegal anywhere in the world. So this could crop up at any point. And when it does, uh, you'll probably be getting a call from us. Carrie, thank you so much for walking us through this. You're very welcome. Carrie Bowman of the University of Toronto. For more from us, you can head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. You can always give us some feedback, whether you would clone your pet, whether you would clone an extinct species, whether you would clone a person. I'm just interested. You can send it to hello at the big story podcast.ca or you can call us up and chat about it 416-935-5935. The big story is available in every single podcast player and it's on smart speakers. All you got to do is ask it to play the big story podcast. Joseph Fish is the lead producer of the big story. Robin Simon is also a producer on this show. Stephanie Phillips is our showrunner. Sound design this week was handled by Christian Prohom, Mark Angley, Robin Edgar, and Ryan Clark. Mary Jubrin is our digital editor. Diana Kay is our manager of business development. I am your host, as well as your executive producer, Jordan Heath Rawlings. Together, all of us are the Frequency Podcast Network, which is a division of Rogers. We'll have an episode of In This Economy in your feed tomorrow. It's a look at RRSPs. You might think you need to contribute to them. Some people think they need to withdraw from them. We'll be back with a fresh episode of The Big Story on Monday. Thank you, as always, for listening. Have a great weekend, and we'll talk then.